today we have a very interesting paper on special deals from special investors, the rise of state connected private owners. Uh, Tang Tai Xie from University of Chicago will present. Tang Tai, you have 25 minutes. Okay, great. Uh, th thanks a lot, everybody, from from uh, uh, coming. So this is uh, th this we're 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 incredibly excited about this work. We've been at it for five or six years now, and this is joint work with uh, Tong An, who I don't believe is here, with um, Michael and and with uh, Xin Wang. So the way I thought I would start is by talking about a, a company that you may have seen in the news because of the crackdown on the internet companies. And this is a company that Zhiguo brought to my attention. So it's a company called Baihan Credit. And the only reason I mentioned it because it's a very common story. It's a very common story. So basically what, what happened a few years ago was that there's this, this, is the, the, this company was created and the, the the idea behind this company was that it was supposed to be the first licensed personal credit agency. What is interesting about this company was that it was a joint venture between the PBOC and Financial and Tencent, right? And, and you can sort of see, you know, why this combination uh, might, uh, uh, might be a useful one. Now, it turns out we now know that it didn't quite work. It, 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 it didn't quite, quite work, but I want to just... So I want you to, to just take this case and, and, and the argument we want to make to you is that this particular model uh, over the last 15 or 20 years has become a really, uh, it, it's, it's been a really common model. The two other examples I want to bring to your attention from the early days of this model, and I want to go back to to uh, Chinese industrial policy, which was called the strategic and uh, emerging industries, which roughly was prevalent from the late 1960s. And I think it died an official death in 2014. And if you don't remember this, so think of this as the precursor of the China 2025 plan. The idea was the same, the model was different. Uh, the idea was the same that they wanted, the, the goal was to create dominant uh, Chinese companies in the strategic sectors. The model was different. The model then was, was that, we, the, that, that state-owned firms were to be the dominant firms. And the model in addition was that uh, the way that this was going to be accomplished was that there were going to be massive barriers to entry. And the idea was that you know, like if uh, that in, in, in these strategic sectors, only state-owned firms were allowed to allowed to operate. What now? What is really interesting about uh, about uh, uh, the strategic and uh, emerging industries that Michael and I have documented that when you look actually at what happened. Um, in the vast majority of the strategic and emerging industries, it wasn't followed through. That is what you see in all the strategic and emerging industries, despite the intention, despite the legal framework that stipulated that only state-owned firms were allowed to produce steel, only state-owned firms were allowed to produce cars, only state-owned firms were allowed to produce aluminum, it didn't turn out to be that way. It, it didn't. It didn't turn. It didn't turn. Uh, turn out to be that way. And, and and I just want to give you two examples of why was it that it didn't turn out to. It didn't uh, turn out that way. That that is. Uh, and the two examples I I want to bring up is is that one of the companies is is a car company called Cherry, and when the company got started for a couple of years, it was operating in a legal gray zone. That, that is, it, it was not part of, part of the plan. It wasn't authorized to, to make cars. And basically, eventually after struggling, what, the, what they did is that they, they basically uh, got uh, Shanghai Auto, which was one of the companies that was part of the plan to take an investment in Cherry. And then it was that investment which maybe played some role in, in, in allowing Cherry to get, to get the full license to make a car. 
Um, now, just want to just say this is a useful point to say that it, 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 this is not really so much about state versus private, because Cherry was also a state-owned firm. It was just a small state-owned firm, and it wasn't part of the plan. The second example I, wa I want to bring to your attention was that another one of these strategic industries is aluminum. And there, the restrictions were even more, more stringent. That is, it wasn't a bunch of state-owned firms that was authorized to produce cars. Here, it was only one company, which is the China Aluminum Corporation. It's one of the, the, the central SASAC companies. But what you see over this really interesting period from 2000 to about 2006 and 2007, what you saw was that a bunch of private companies entered into the market for, for aluminum and basically took away the monopoly of the, the China aluminum corporation, despite the fact that this was not part of the plan. What they were doing was technically illegal. And one of the companies that did this was this, is this company called the East Hope Group. They created this company called East Hope Aluminum. And the way they did it was that they basically entered into a joint venture with a with the local government of the small city. And the main, the two main things that the small city had was that they had access to reserves of bauxite and they had access to cheap electricity. So very much the same kind of model that, that the people behind Baihan Credit were, 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 uh, were, trying to, uh, were, were trying to use, okay? So what, what we do in this paper is that we are going to try to document the extent to which this has been the dominant model for the growth of the private sector. And what we bring to the table, and this is what took us an enormous uh, amount of time, is that we, we bring to the table administrative data on the universe of firms in China. So every single firm in China along with data on their owners. And this, so this is important. It's important to understand the data. So let me just spend a minute just saying more about the nature of the data that we have. So it's a data from, from the, the registry of firms in China. So basically every firm in China is, is in this data from the largest data firm down to the smallest noodle shop vendor. So the only firms, quote unquote, uh, uh, firms that are not in this data are the self-employed. We have two cross sections of the data. We have, we have the cross section data in 2013. We have we have the cross section of the the data in 2019. And just let me just say what what is in the data. So for example, in the data in 2019, we have all the uh, it's it's the data on all the firms that are active in 2019, plus all the firms that were active in the past. But 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 are but 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 uh, are now dead. The key virtue of the data, which I was really stunned by, was that the data identifies the owners of every single firm. Okay, so roughly the you can think about owners of Chinese firms. You can classify them into three groups. Into three groups, they are individual people. Okay, so think about that, you know, if you open up a company and you register, you say that you are the owner of the company, that's an individual. Think about a person, okay? And the data provides an anonymized personal ID of, of this person. The second type of owner is what's called a legal, uh, is what's called a legal person owner with the name of the legal person and the ID. And the way that you want to think about a legal person that is that it is either another uh, another company, or what is going to be very, very typical is that it's a holding shell, okay? The third type of company is what's called, uh, what's, what's, called uh, what, what's called a collective owner, okay? So, for example, the publicly traded shares of a listed company is grouped in this, is classified in this data as, as, a, collective, uh, as a collective owner. The next thing I want to say, which is important, and I think this is a well-known fact in China, is that when you look at the owners of almost every single large private Chinese company, they are going to be owned by several holding shells. That that's the, the, that that I you know I, I that, that that's just the typical thing that you see. And then the other thing that is also what that's also I think known is that when you look at each one of these 
holding shells, they themselves are owned by other holding shells. It's a very standard ownership pattern. And then the ownership, and then these holding shells are, the, are themselves owned by, a, a other, uh, by a, other holding shells. So, you know, if you, if you don't have a whole lot of patience, or if you just look at the, the owner of the company, you know, it is really very difficult to figure out who is actually behind this company, who is the owner of the uh, of, of, of the uh, company. But the beauty of this data is that as long as the holding shell is a Chinese holding shell, that the that holding shell is also in the data. Okay. So what one can do, what one can do is that you can look at the owners of a company. And then there are going to be a bunch. There are going to be a bunch of holding shells. And then you can look at who are the owners of the holding shells. You can find out they're owned by a bunch of other holding shells. And then you look at the owners of these holding shells, and they're going to be owned by a bunch of other holding shells. But as long as you have enough patience or you have enough computing power, eventually the trail ends, and you are going to find you are going to find the actual person or or the entity. That 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 is behind uh, behind a particular company. So that's what we're going to show you in this data. We are we are going to penetrate all the holding shells, and then we are going to identify the ultimate the the the, uh, the 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 ultimate owner of 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 the company, and then we're going to try to tell you how the nature of the relationships between different types of owners has changed in the last 20 years in China. Uh, uh, two uh, other things I want to say that, you know, funny enough, um, uh, if it's a foreign holding shell, they are not in the data. So if it's a foreign holding shell, then we know nothing. We, we, we know that. So the funny, if it's, for example, it's a holding shell based in Hong Kong, it's not in the data. So we don't, so, so the trail ends. There, but if it's a Chinese hole, if it's a Chinese holding shell, then there's almost perfect transparency once you have access to the data. And then the last thing we have is that along with with each owner, we have the equity share of 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 of, of the owner. So let, let me just give you an example of what a typical company lo looks like. Okay, so the company, I it's it's the the the. So I want to show you two companies. Um, this company called East Hope Aluminum, which is the company one one of the very first private companies that that went into uh, went into aluminum, and the other company is called uh, Sanmin Shah Datsang Mining. So, the two companies are at the very bottom of this graph, and the way I, I just want to tell you what the colors mean. Um, the dark gray means that it's a real company, the it's a real private company. The red means that it's a state-owned firm. Blue means that it's a person, and gray is what our our companies that we don't know for sure, but we suspect are holding shells. So just just want, just want to quickly walk you through uh, through this because this is a very it's a very standard pattern that you are going to see. Who are the owners of this company that broke into the monopoly of the the? The China uh, Lubin Corporation. What when you look in the registration there, you, you're going to find that it's owned by three shells: the East Hope Group Company, who owns 37 percent of the company, and there's two other companies to the right, Shi uh, Debang Metal and Shi Debang Trade, and they uh, collectively own about 60 some percent of the company. The last two holding shells are actually registered in uh, in uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, they're, they're uh, 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 but we did some work and we, we, we think that we have reasonable confidence that these two companies are owned by the two blue, by, by, by the blue circle on the top, which is this guy called uh, Liu Yongxing, who was the founder of the East Hope Group, and, and another Liu, who, who I think is well known, is a son. So think of this as the, as, as the father's son. Now, if you look up to the Chinese holding shell, the East Hope Group, well, there it's easy because we can just look at the data and we can see that the East Hope Group Company Limited, it's owned by two other holding shells, the company on the left and the company on the right. And then there, th this case, 
we didn't have to do that much work because we could, it was because once you look at the, the two holding shells on the top, there are both of these holding shells are 100% owned by the two, by, by, by the father and the son. Very quickly, the other company, Samesha Datang Mining, 13% of the company is owned by, is owned by that gray company the, um, uh, called Mianchi Mining. Mianchi Mining is owned by the two same, but two of the same holding shells, and then the two holding shells are owned by 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 uh, by uh, by by uh, the father and the son. So thirteen percent of Samencha uh, Dasang Mining is owned by by Mr. Liu and his son. Another thirteen percent is owned by this other company called. Samencha uh, uh, Jingjiang Mining, which is basically part of a large mining conglomerate. As far as we can tell, it's a private company. And then 75% are owned by five, by five, uh, by five estate owned firm. So this is a very typical pattern that you, you are gonna see. So let me just say that this is the last I, I am gonna talk about the holding shelves. I think it's a fascinating question. Why are there so many holding shelves? Why has this uh, developed over time? We're going to penetrate through all that, and we're just going to focus on the ultimate owner of the company. That is, in the case of East Hope Aluminum, we're going to say that 100% of East Hope Aluminum is owned by, is owned by uh, the father and the son. Okay, And that's all that we are going to focus on. Samisha Datsang Mining, we're, we're going to say it's a joint venture between the father and the son, between the owners behind uh, Samencha uh, Jingjiang Mining and the five and the five state-owned firms that own that own the majority equity stake, so we're, we are going to focus uh, on the ultimate owner. So to think of as as the circle at the very end of the chain. Okay. The second thing that we are going to do is I that we are going to yes. I have uh, ten minutes remaining. Okay. Great. Thanks. We're going to focus on the equity links between the owners. That is, we're going to look at the relationship between Mr. and uh, between uh, uh, between the two Liu's and the five state-owned firms. Okay. So let me now just I will stick with East Hope. Uh, I'll stick with East Hope. But now I want you to uh, I will want to just pull back a little and look at this company in totality. Okay. So. What is the East Hope Group? So that what we're going to do here is that we are we are going to say let's identify the East Hope Group as being the collection of companies in which in which uh, the Liu family owns at least a ten percent equity stake. What is that? Well, there, there's a total of two hundred and thirty six companies in the data in two thousand nineteen in which in, in which this is the case. Okay, and then of these companies. 27 of them are joint ventures. Okay, they're, 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 they are to, uh, they're, they're to, to, uh, 27. And who are these joint ventures with? And here we are going, what you look at this and you say, you can find that 15 of the joint ventures are with state-owned firms, are with, state, well, are with, with uh, uh, state-owned firms. And there's a, there's a very clear characteristic of the state-owned firms that, that have joint ventures. The federal firms are typically much larger than the private companies or the private owners that they do business with. And here's a, a really rough way to look at this. The total uh, registered capital of the federal firms is 226 bi uh, billion yen. That's the average of, of, of each one of this. The, the total registered capital that is owned by the new family is 26 uh, billion. The other characteristic is that, is that um, is that 12 of the joint ventures are with other private uh, owners. That's a third column. And the other distinguishing characteristic of the other private, the, 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 of the private owners that the Liu family has a joint venture with is that they're typically much smaller, okay? Their total registered capital of, of, of the typical uh, private owner that Liu family has business with is 5 billion as opposed to 26 a billion of the Liu family. So let, let me just um, uh, just summarize what I think we we take from this. That is that when you look at a company like the East Hope Group, a very standard, you know, it's not even that large, right? It's it's a very typical private firm. What you see is that you there there are multiple ownership types. 
East Hope has joint ventures with 15 state owners and 11 private owners. The second thing that you can see very clearly is that there's also a higher there, there's a clear higher hierarchy of owners. That is, the largest owners are the joint are the state owners that have joint ventures with the East Hope Group. Then the next largest owners are East Hope itself, and then there's the next tier, which are the private owners that don't have joint ventures with state owners, but they have joint ventures with East Hope. We're going to call these. Uh, owners that are indirectly connected to a state owner. They don't have joint ventures with a state owner, but they have a joint venture with another private owner that themselves have a joint uh, venture with the state group, all right? So let me now move out even more, and let me just show you some of the, some, some of the general patterns that you see in, in the data. So, uh, so this is the data for, for 2019. And the first fact I want to show to you is the top owners in China are connected. So if you look at the, if you take all the owners in China, okay, and you rank them and you take the top 100 uh, owners, 60, uh, 63 of them are, are state and 37 of them are, are private. Of the 63 largest uh, state owners, every single one of them has joint ventures with, 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 with some typically multiple private owners. Of the 37 private owners, 31 of them have joint ventures with state owners, and three of them are what we call indirectly uh, connected. If you look at the top 100 the largest uh, owners, you see a similar trend, but it's the, 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 the fraction that are uh, connected is, is lower. But so what this says is that when you look at the largest owners in China, so the, the distinction that many people make about state versus private, I, I think it's at least in, 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 the, in the last 10 years, last 50 years in China, is not a very useful distinction. That is, there's no such, at least the way I think about it is that there's no such thing as a pure state owner. There's no such thing as a pure private or entirely private owner, that everything is all just a mix of great. It, it's 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 it, it's all that it's all this um um uh it's this uh partnership the the second thing i want to just convey to you is that the pattern that i showed you in terms of the east hope group of this higher hierarchy is very clear when you look at the entire cross-section data so here's one way to say it so then um, what i plot on the x-axis is, is the distance of the owner to the state so distance one means that that's, that's an owner like the East Hope Group that has a direct joint, that, that has a joint venture with a state owner. Distance two means that you have a joint venture, not with the state, but you have a joint venture with another company that, that itself has a joint venture with, with the state, all the way up to, the, to, to 10. And what I show on the y, a, a y axis is the registered capital of that state, uh, of that owner relative to an owner that has no connections with the state. So if you want to have a fact to take away uh, with you, that is uh, an owner that is directly connected to the state is about 250 times larger, okay? Then, uh, uh, then uh, an owner that it has no connection to the state. The other thing that you see with the state is that, 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 that you see in terms of the hierarchy that, remember this pattern that, that I showed you, that it's not, the ESO would just, it's not, when you look at their ventures, it's not just that they have ventures with state owners. They also have joint ventures with other private owners. And here's a way to try to, uh, here I, I'm showing you how many joint ventures they have with, with, uh, with what the term we use is downward investors. So a company that is distance one has typically three joint ventures with with a smaller private, uh, 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 with smaller private owners. So when you see this, I think it's useful to just to think to think about how is it that this this system, that this network, gets created. So it's not just that state owners have uh, they they make joint ventures with private owners, and that's how it happens. So that's only a small part of the picture. The other really important part of the picture is that then once a private owner gets connected, they then turn around and they do exactly the same thing, okay? It, it might be useful to think about this as a model of the, the same model that we are now sadly familiar with of how COVID spreads. 
That is, it's not that you, it, that the person that is the patient one or patient zero infects uh, 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 the next uh, person. Uh, that's, that's not what happens. What, what happens is that then the patient that gets infected, they turn around and infect uh, other they, they, uh, they infect uh, uh, other people. And the way that, 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 that COVID propagates is through this mechanism. And it's a very similar thing here. That is the way that this network propagates is through what each private firm does after they, they, they become connected. In fact, you could think about this plot that I'm showing you as almost the equivalent of, of, this, of this notion of R naught that we are now very, uh, we are now very, familiar with in these SRR mo uh, uh, models that in, in fact it does exactly the same thing once once this number goes below one then the system dies out okay but the system if this number remains above one then eventually every company in China gets to become connected but the fact that it gradually goes below it gradually drops below one that is what basically limits the reach of the system. Okay. Hand that, uh, hand two more minutes. Two more minutes. Okay, great. All right. The, the next thing I want to tell you is, is that this has increased by a lot over the last 20 years. So it takes place in, there, there are two basic patterns that are driving this. There's an increase in investments by state owners in private firms. In 2013, the typical state owner made three investments. And in 2019, it's now 15. So the consequence of that is, is that by 2019, you know, the number of private owners directly connected to state basically increased by a factor of five, 15 divided by three. There were 100,000 private owners with equity ties to state owners, and they account for about 18% of all registered capital in China. But as I've shown you before, these connected private owners, they then turn around and do the same thing. So the consequence of that is that there's also been a very large increase in private owners that are indirectly connected to state owners. And they collectively account for about 15% of, of registered capital. So if you put these two numbers together, these two groups of owners account in 2019 for 33% of, of all registered uh, capital in, in China. So here's the, number, the section of, of the number of connected private owners by distance to the state in three years. And you can see that there's been a huge increase in the number of connected private owners that are pretty distant from the state. That is, for example, you, you look in the, in the 1990, there were zero owners that were at distance more than seven away from for, from from, uh, from the state. By 2019, you basically had several million. Okay, so that this, the, um, I mean, I'm out of time, so that, that, uh, I always uh, skip this. So this is the change of what, what, what we see. So the change in the share of registered capital over the last, from 1990, uh, from, sorry, it's not 1990, it's 2000 to 2019, the, the, reg the share of connected private owners increased by 19%. Just to give you a frame of reference, the share of all private owners increased by 22%. So basically almost all of the increase in the share of the, the, the private sector, it's coming from this mechanism. That, and then at the same time, the state owners that are connected, the, 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 think of this as being the companies that are at the very top of the food chain, the state, or, or, or the state uh, owners that are enabling the, this activity, their share falls by 60%. That doesn't mean that, that they shrank, they just shrank in relative terms, right? They shrank relative to, uh, to, uh, 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 to all these private companies that are growing uh, that they, I, I, I guess the way we think about it, it's a growth that the state owners and the growth of the state owners enable. So if you give me just 20 more seconds, let me just try to, uh, get back out and from the details and try to tell what we think the story is. That is, we, we think the story is that what, what's happened over time is that it's become easier to scale or to leverage the connections of people or, or entities or companies that, are, that have connections, that are connected. 
So the consequence of that is just what you see in the data that the number and the size of the connected owners has gone up. Now, what do we think that this is what the thing is going on? We think that what's what's happened is that the nature of the, the regime of, of special deals, which is um, uh, Michael and uh, Tong En and I ha have a previous paper where we say the way to think about the uh, the 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 the, uh, the 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 system in China for for private sector is that it's a regime of a special deals and there we tell the story about how it's all about what the local governments are doing by providing special deals to to these companies. What we think has changed is that it is no longer abs no longer necessary to have direct access to a local. Uh, uh, to a uh, local uh, communist party official. That is, it's become more institutionalized. That is what you need now is that you only need to have a connected investor. And then what the connected investor does is that, uh, that it, it is that they scale their advantage. Uh, 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 and you can think about what, what goes on is that it, this is the system that may, uh, you know, may perfectly align the, the incentives of the two parties. And then the last thing I want, 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 want to say is that then we basically filter these facts in uh, through the lenses of, of, of a macro model of, uh, of uh, network formation. And then our, our very rough estimate is that this mechanism accounts for about for 27% for of the growth of the private sector, private sector GDP. So, you know, it's, I think it's large, but it doesn't account for everything, of course, right? Um, all right, so I'm going to end here, um, uh, and I'll okay. turn, give the floor to Randy. So thank you very much for letting me discuss this paper. I think it raises some very interesting issues. Um, and uh, first, I, I have to say, as a discussant, my duty is to criticize the paper. And criticizing is much easier than writing, so I can give all kinds of cheap shots here, and probably you shouldn't take me too seriously, but that's my job. Okay, so there are six stylized facts plus one that I call fact zero. Fact zero is that lots of registered corporations in China are held via shell companies or chains of shell companies. And this is interesting. Uh, the paper speculates that it might be separation of ownership from control, but then the paper goes on to show that there really isn't much separation of ownership from control. So in the example that you saw earlier, when you add up the stakes of all of these different shell companies that are between the ultimate owner and the operating companies, they add up to 100%. So control equals ownership equals 100%. So what's going on? Why all the shell companies? And I also just finished rereading a paper by Sharon Bellinson and co-authors. And what they argue is that a lot of times these sorts of structures may have to do with sheltering the owners from liability. And in the paper, I read that each firm's registered capital is a cap on the owner's liability. Now, in China, my understanding is that personal bankruptcy is kind of like not paying off a student loan in the US. It follows you and follows you and follows you until you die. And so you really want to avoid personal bankruptcy in China because the law is kind of unfriendly. And so maybe by putting corporations with very small amounts of registered capital in between you and the operating companies, you put real small caps on your liability. I just wonder if that's going on. I don't know if it is, but that just occurred to me as I read this. Now, the first fact that the paper calls a fact is that the large owners are connected. And I guess I believe that the party said, grasp the large and let go the small, and the party did what it said. So that's not surprising really, but you know, it shows that the party told the truth. Uh, private owners higher in the hierarchy are bigger and have more downward connections. That It would be surprising if you found the opposite. It would be surprising if you found that private owners higher in the hierarchy had smaller and fewer downward connections because, because of the way the hierarchy is, is, uh, is, is constructed. So that again, I think is, is kind of what, what, what would make sense. Now, fact three, connected investors are not majority shareholders. This one, I, I, I had some problems with. So let me just pause and go into the paper in a lot more detail in just certain parts of it. So 
what they did is they said that th this is how they, they define a controlling shareholder. For each firm I denote YI first equals max YIK and denote YI second as the second largest number of the series YIK. If YI first is greater than YI second, plus the sum of a bunch of XIs, which guarantees that no other owner can more mo own more than YI first by cash flow rights, the owner who owns YI first is therefore the firm's controlling shareholder. Okay, so you gotta kind of go back and parse that. What does that mean? So what are these excise? Well, the excise are shares of this firm that are owned by other firms. And the YIs are shares owned by the four types of owners described in appendix C. That's, that's what it says right, right in the text. So what's appendix C? Appendix C describes how different kinds of state owners are classified. And what it says is kind of puzzling to me. So for instance, we treat the Department of Finance of Shandong Province and the SASAC, uh, the state-owned holding company of Shandong Province is the same owner as both are different departments of the Shandong provincial government. However, we assume that the government of Shandong Province and the government of Jinnan City, the capital of Shandong are two different owners. The exception to this rule is that if a state firm is directly and 100% owned by the government, we classify it as a separate state owner. So it seems like we're kind of fragmenting state ownership in a way that I don't really understand. Okay, so what does that actually mean? It means that we, I think if this is what I understand they're doing, that a firm has a connected ultimate controlling shareholder. If its first largest ultimate controlling shareholder is connected and has a stake that's bigger than the second largest ultimate controlling shareholder plus the stakes of all the other firms. And this second largest ultimate controlling owner, if I understand this correctly, could be another government entity. So this is a funny way to do it, uh, if, and maybe I misunderstand it. Uh, so if I do, please, please clarify this. So the Communist Party is united. Just ask them, ask anybody in the Communist Party of China, are you united? And they'll say, yes, we're united. Okay, I've done that and that's what they say. So why not sum all of the government stakes up together? You know, why not just add up the stakes of the city government and the provincial government and the national government, because all of those stakes provide connections of the sort that the paper is talking about in the model. Maybe they provide connections to different governments, but they're all useful in the way that the paper wants to talk about. So why not just amalgamate all the government stakes? And then if the government stake is bigger than 20%, that's the control threshold that's used in most studies of uh, control chains, then use a weakest link hierarchical control chain rather than this rather complicated formula. Now, maybe that formula, is, there's a reason for it, but the paper leaves it very mysterious. The, the paper presents this formula and goes through it, you know, presents it with a, a lot of abstract mathematical detail, but there isn't really an explanation that I can find about why we do it that way. So why not do it with the weakest leak in a hierarchical control chain using a 20% threshold and amalgamating state uh, control blocks all together. Uh, complications are necessary. You do need more complicated ways of assessing control. For instance, in Japanese Zaibatsu or Korean Chaibal, where you have reciprocal cross ownership or more complicated patterns of circular ownership or networks of ownership, where lots of firms own little blocks in each other. And in those, there's a nice paper by uh, Almeida et al, where they show how you can use a Shubik uh, Shapley value from game theory to uh, assess who controls what, where you've got these more complicated circular patterns of ownership. But those structures are only mentioned in passing in this study. So I get the impression they're not that important in China. Um, so if you, instead of separating the various state stakes into city stakes and province stakes and uh, special uh, state entity holding company stakes, if you just amalgamate all the state stakes together, I wonder if you would find that maybe the state controlled state influence blocks add up to majorities in most private sector companies in China. That wouldn't surprise me. And I think that would be a really interesting finding if it's true. Um, 
But you may be right that control rights in China maybe ought not to be measured the way they are in other countries. So in China, my understanding, and I may be wrong, so please correct me if I am, is that every private sector firm of any importance has a Communist Party committee and a Communist Party secretary to advise the CEO and the board of directors. And generally, the party committee and the party secretary are quiet, but they intervene occasionally to help the CEO and the board of directors avoid making mistakes. Um, so my question is, do communist party committees and secretaries create another, pa another pathway for connections, another pathway for state influence of the company and for the company to connect with the state that really doesn't have anything to do with ownership? Some work suggests this. So a, a paper came across my desk recently about how uh, Chinese state-owned enterprises abruptly in innovate more after a scientist becomes their party secretary. That suggests that these party secretaries and party committees might be more than decoration. They might actually be something that has really important connections, uh, maybe two-way connections. And so how to best measure control in the Chinese context, I think is something that actually we need to think about a lot. Uh, and so I'm not willing to jump out and say this paper does it wrong because they don't do what uh, other papers have done in other countries. But, but I, I, I think this is a puzzle. Uh, how, how should we do this? Uh, the number of private owners connected to the state has increased. Um, there, the, 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 this fact may come too easily because the way it's done is they take the number of private owners directly connected to state owners times the number of state owners that undertake investments with private owners times the number of private owners each state owner invests in. That's where the paper says this number comes from. But the problem is you can have multiple state owners undertaking investments with any given private owner. You can have state owners investing in private owners without gaining control blocks. I'm not sure whether these are control blocks or just any ownership the papers not clear about that. Um, but if this is what they're doing, then there may be a bit of double counting. I suspect that the paper's conclusion is correct anyway, but it would be more convincing to just kind of tighten that up. Private owners grow faster after they get connected. So here what they do is they uh, do panel regressions and they show graphs like this. So here's the firm going along and then suddenly it gets more connected and then you see it up here. And this is number of years before and after the firm becomes more connected. One, two, three years before, one, two, three, four, five years after. Um, and the one issue here is that the way they measure the firm getting bigger is they say the firm gets bigger if it's connected to more other firms and the firm gets bigger if the number of connections it has to other owners gets bigger. So if the firm becomes more connected, it well, becomes more connected. So there's kind of a little bit of self-referentiality in there. Now, is this trivially self-referential? I don't think so. But I do think that the null hypothesis, when a firm becomes more connected, of course, it becomes more connected. So the question is, does it become more connected than you would expect from randomly, say, adding a link to some other entity in this network? Uh, does, it, uh, does it connect to, to a node in the, in the network that has more, more connectivity? And I think that that might well be true, but that would be the thing to test. This, 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 this null hypothesis, I think, uh, could, could cause problems. Uh, now, more interestingly, how do you run from your panel regressions when you have three cross sections of data 10 years apart? So this one, I had to send an email to the authors and they sent me a revised version of the paper that has more in the appendix about this. So you, I, I think the original version of the paper is still up on the, on the website, but so, so, so you, you, you can't see this in your version of the paper. But basically what they do is they use the 2010 cross section to get all ownership shares of all firms, and then they backfill that into all years. 
So you've got exactly the same ownership stakes year by year by year, backfilling from 2019. Then the 2019 data apparently also gives each firm's first and last registration year. So you can look back and you can say, ah, this firm entered the data in 2005 and this other firm left in 2011. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what the ownership is if the firm left, but that's something that perhaps can be clarified. And then what happens is because firms are exiting and entering, when you do this calculation, this equation here that you use to determine what your controlling shareholder is, that equation works out differently for the same firm in different years because there are different other firms that you can plug in to this equation. Their stakes are the same, but some firms disappear and enter. And so this gives you a different set of results in different years. And if I understand it correctly, that's how they're getting these changes in direct and indirect ownership. And then they run the regression. And of course, the problem is the data are utterly non-independent over time because it's the same uh, 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 data being backfilled, exactly the same ownership stakes. And so you've got to worry a little bit about regressions like this, but fortunately they don't actually do significance tests. They just do diagrams, which I think, yeah, that's okay. So there may be a bit of inconsistency here, but I, I think the exercise is still perhaps helpful. Um, there are some strange things though. So like here in the equation, they uh, have- Andy, you have 10 minutes. Hi, Randall, you have uh, 10 minutes left. Okay, that's oh, fine. I'm, I'm not gonna need all 10 minutes of it. Okay. Okay, so in this in this uh, regression that they run, they they have fourteen years back and fifteen years forward. If I understand this correct, tau from minus fourteen to plus fifteen around each event, which suggests thirty years of data, but the data are only for two thousand to two thousand nineteen. So again, there's some mysteries to exactly what's going on here. The paper is just a little bit unclear about all of this stuff. Um, so th then private owners, uh, uh, connected private owners explain uh, increased importance of the private sector and increased importance of the private sector is defined in terms of the number of industries firms are connected to, the number of provinces firms are connected to. So again, it's more connections causing more connections. Again, I don't think it's trivially self-referential, but it's got the same problems that the previous set of stuff had. So suppose it's all true. And I think the, the, the facts are, are, despite these quibbles that I have, probably likely valid. So one possibility is connections help you get loans from SOE banks, but you know, so could party committees or secretaries. Why does a chain of ownership help with that? Um, more convincingly might be shadow banking. So shadow banking in China, I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, often involves one corporation, one non-financial corporation lending to another, either directly as a loan or through trade credit. And so what might be happening is SOE banks lend to firms directly connected to them or to the state. Those firms provide shadow banking credit to firms they're connected with. Those firms provide shadow banking credit to firms they're connected with and so on down the chain. That would explain why you have these kinds of connections if that's true. And that would be interesting. If that's correct, it would have really important implications for, for instance, monetary policy transmission in China. Because if you squeeze the banks, then you'd squeeze this whole chain of lending through the shadow banking system. Um, connections might be a form of corruption that aren't yet eliminated. And uh, the, the, the Chinese government launched a massive anti-corruption drive in 2012, but it's, it's still ongoing. And so suppose that rather than firms choosing to become connected, you have powerful people choosing a firm that they'd like to partially own. And you might think about that as corrupt officials just kind of coming in and saying, hey, nice firm you've got, I'd like to have part of it. Now, I don't think that's necessarily happening in China, but as a researcher, one has to think about things like that as a possibility. What else? Uh, you know, I don't have a lot of time, but I can probably come up with a few others. The explanation the paper kind of seizes on is, I think, not entirely incorrect. Uh, connections help firms grease bureaucratic gears, but, you know, so could party secretaries and party committees help you grease bureaucratic gears gears, why does a chain uh, 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 of uh, block uh, equity blocks help better? Now, the, the, the paper associates this with the model. 
And actually most of the paper is this model. So uh, the, the model, I'm, yeah, since, the, since the discussion didn't talk much about the model, I'm not going to either. So I'm just gonna kind of zip through it. So um, the model is about firm productivity, but the data are firm size. So how do you talk about productivity when you only have size data? What they do is actually kind of interesting. They estimate productivity as a function of firm size using power law from more complete data for larger firms. Then they take that uh, estimation and infer the productivity of all firms using registered capitals as their size. Um, and they assume that uh, uh, the, this power law uh, applies throughout. Now, firm size does obey a power law and firm productivity does obey a power law, but power laws are tail phenomena of probability distributions. Power laws hold better and better as you go further out into the tail. And so there's a kind of an issue of how well does a power law work when you use something that's really a phenomenon of the tail of the distribution to estimate what's going on with a lot of little tiny firms that are over close to the uh, uh, left-hand side of the axis. Um, the, the model then focuses on this idea that uh, having connections reduces a kind of a tax that state bureaucracy puts on the firm. And that, that might make more sense, but there are other possible things that could be going on. Uh, so, you know, you just need to think, what are all the things that are related to productivity? Well, more political rent seeking is more productive. That's getting close. More innovative is more productivity. Uh, older firms are less productive than younger firms. Unionized firms are less productive than non-unionized firms. Poorly governed firms are less productive than well-governed firms. Opaque firms are less productive than transparent firms. I just got that by Googling uh, papers on this topic and the, the, the number of papers is in the thousands. So there's actually all kinds of things that are related to productivity other than firm size. And so one has to then wonder, does more closely connected stand in for which of these things? Does it stand in for being more innovative or less innovative? Um, and that, 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 that's, I think, important because where this productivity difference comes from is kind of critical to understanding what the implications of these six facts are. Now, uh, the model is really hard to follow. Uh, and, uh, uh, I, I, I was thinking about John Maynard Keynes as I read it, too large a proportion of recent mathematical economics are mere concatenations as imprecise as the initial assumptions they rest on, which allow the author to lose sight of the complexities and interdependencies of the real world in a maze of pretentious and unhelpful symbols. Now, I think Keynes goes way too far. I don't think that's right. A mathematical model can add substantial value by crystallizing the intuition. And so my, my challenge to the authors of this paper is prove Keynes wrong. Take your model and make the model clear and intuitive and crystallize the intuition. Right now, I, I, had to sp I spent like two days reading this model, trying to figure out what was going on. And I had to go back and forth to look things up. And I had to figure out how the uh, variables were being added and, 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 and what was going on throughout it. It's actually really, really hard to read. And I think that's a shame because I, I, I think the paper should be more like the presentation that you just gave, which was really clear and really easy to follow. And it made this seem really important. Now, it's not that I don't know math. I, 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 I like Keynes, my first degree is in mathematics. So uh, when, when I see measure theory notation and stuff, I know what it means. It's not that I'm flummoxed by that, but I just didn't really get the model. Um, so, you know, Keynes explaining himself, I'd rather be roughly right than precisely wrong. And, and I think that's kind of an important thing that economists need to take to heart, or at least I do. Um, I think the stylized facts are roughly right. And so this is a good research project because no, the stylized no. facts are no, roughly no. right. Yeah, okay. No, no, no. Uh, okay, and I think the model is likely not precisely wrong. It's just kind of hard to follow. Um, and I may be wrong, I often am. Um, so don't take me 
too seriously. I, I'm a discussant and it's easy to criticize papers. I like quoting this American politician. I think he was from Texas. Uh, any jackass can kick a barn down, but it takes a carpenter to build one. So, you know, don't, don't take me too seriously. I think it's an interesting paper. I think it has huge potential. I love the presentation, but the paper is really kind of like it, 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 it needs to be more like the presentation. So thank you very much. And, and congratulations on a very good research project. Thanks, uh, Randall. Um, Hannah, would you like to respond to Randall maybe for the, briefly? I think it would be more productive to if, if you can just take questions from the audience uh, okay. because I'm, there's, a, there, there's 123 uh, people and I'm sure people have questions. And then I, I will try to answer both Randy's question and I'll, I see my uh, co-authors are here too, so I'll rope them in. Uh, well, let me, okay. Let me, well, we have a panel here. The panelists, please feel free to uh, ask questions as well. Let me start with one question here. Um, I think what's most interesting in this paper is of course the, the state connection. Uh, this is anecdotally, that's what you feel living in China. There is an upward reach by these uh, private firms wanting to get state connections. So I wonder if you, I mean, the paper gives a very nice um, descriptive description on the on, on that trend. I wonder if, like uh, what Randall mentioned is his discussion, can, can we give more motivation? Can we find evidence of this state connectedness really is beneficial for the firms? Why are they, you know, making this upward reach to get more state connection. Is it, you know, for more financing? Is it for uh, more information or more protection, a sense of uh, safety? So maybe a, a discussion, more analysis, more investigation around this dimension would be helpful. Yeah. yeah. So that's a, that's a good question. And, and uh, Randy asked the same question. So. I have some views on this, but maybe this is the uh, uh, Tongen. Are you here? I see his name up. Or uh, yes. So maybe I, I can get you to to get to give your views on this. Uh, when when private owners are making these connections, what are they looking for? Um, I think for different firms, uh, it's uh, uh, the benefits uh, differ. Uh, let me give you uh, an example from the uh, construction uh, industry. Recently, a lot of uh, uh, construction uh, firms, previously private held, they uh, sought out uh, uh, state owners because uh, Chinese uh, different levels of Chinese government um, spent a lot on construction projects. In order to get the contract, uh, it's very useful to have a state uh, actor as uh, one of the owners. Uh, for the local government to issue the contract, uh, they feel they are politically covered uh, if uh, the contractor is a state actor instead of a purely private firm. So that, that's uh, one example. And also for getting credit, um, for some of the uh, local banks are controlled by the uh, local government. And uh, so uh, the local government and local state owned enterprises have some influence over their uh, lending. So it's, uh, it's easier for, for a firm to get credit from the bank uh, when it's, it's partially state owned. And also there, uh, one of the reason, uh, part of the reason is that uh, if uh, a loan uh, becomes uh, non-performing, uh, if the loan is uh, lent out to a purely private firm, a lot of questions will be asked. But if the loan is extended to a uh, state-owned firms, then uh, for the loan to become non-performing is not that big an issue. So, so there are a lot of reasons why having a state uh, owner can help you to get contracts, to get uh, financing, to get land, et cetera. Um, may I? 
Oh, sorry. Sorry, please go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Tom. I, 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 um, I, I have. I want to make some, a comment and ask a question first. I really enjoy reading the paper, the one that's on the web, and thank you. And I think the facts that you describe really describe uh, the intuitive feeling we uh, we feel about uh, the Chinese economy, as Panjin just uh, described, just uh, mentioned. So let me think in the in the following way. We start with a blank, uh, blank, no market but the state. Everything is fiat. Government says go, 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 no, no, no. That is the beginning point of the Chinese economy before the reform. And if you're going to do anything, you need to have a connection with the state to get capital, and you need to have an, a connection with the state to get, um, uh, to get market access. So if that's the starting point, then the, the facts that you produce is essentially what we expect when the market gradually changes from everything by fiat to later on by price intermediation and regulation. What you describe is exactly what we'll observe. Number two, and there's a huge literature in financial economics and also in the business, econ in the business economy that talk about pyramids. What you have there is exactly the building uh, of an economy based on a lot of pyramids, or what some people originally would say about is a big push kind of phenomenon. So your, your facts describe our feeling about how the state controlled body of economic activity move into a market economy and into one that is uh, some, some people got lucky and built and build, uh, build a firm and gradually grab more, more and more uh, opportunities, grab more market uh, opportunities and get more access to capital through connections with the state. It's because of the transition from governing by fiat to governing by price intermediation and regulations. So on this, I want to ask a question. I want to ask a question. Um, is this particularly worse than other economy? Number two, what is the implication? Has the, has, has the government uh, ruling the economy by price intermediation and by, uh, by regulation improved? Or still everything is a big combination of fiat, you know, and, and, and economy or a mixture in between. Has government policy because of this uh, improved in its effectiveness. Um, maybe I'll try to answer that. So I, I will say this: that I, I'm uh, among the the team of authors. I'm the only one that's not from China. Uh, so I I, I I I will give you my perspective on on. Uh, that there is a sense that what you see in China has many similarities in many other places in the world. Uh, um, I would say that the thing that, at least from an outsider's perspective, what, what, what seems really remarkable to me is just the, the, the way that these I'm going to call it these informal solutions are scaled up. They're, 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 so so the, the kind of things that, that, that Song En and Michael and I described in our previous paper, the thing that we're, we are describing now in this paper, you can see this in, you can see elements of this anywhere in the world. I mean, anywhere. Uh, well, and that's partly why, you know, Randy was saying that there are thousands of references uh, uh, that you see this in the world. What, but what I think is unique uh, about China, and this, this uh, hopefully this will allow me to, get to uh, 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 answer some of Randy's good question, is, is, is the extent to which these informal things, which in most places occurs, but occurs in a small scale, it occurs in a massive scale. Uh, in uh, uh, in in China, so this uh, this is the way to uh, to think about one of the questions that you asked is you know uh, why isn't uh, local party secretaries enough uh, why do enough and and here is the key reason why 
it, 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 it's not uh, why it, it is not enough. There is a limited number of part of uh, there's a limited number of party secretaries, and each party secretary has a limited number of, of hours in the day that that they they that uh, they, they 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 can do this. What this system does, what this system does, is that it basically takes sort of what a local party secretary does. And it basically replicates that throughout the, the, the throughout the uh, uh, entire economy, and this maybe allows me to to, to uh, uh, answer your question about the model. What well, the model is, is so mysterious, and it's completely our fault for being, making the, the the model impenetrable. But the way the model is really an uh, SIR model. Uh, that's that's the way that you you you. That's a way that you want to. Think about patient zero as the local party secretary. Then, and then the question is, how infectious is the local party secretary? In, in the SR model, how many people do you in uh, 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 how many people do you infect? In this case, how many uh, how many companies are you sponsoring? Right. And, and then it doesn't end there. So this goes to the point about the uh, scaling. If, if it ends there, that's sort of what happens in a, in a, in a, in a typical economy elsewhere in the world. It's the equivalent of the local party secretary does a few things and it stops there, right? But that's to go back to my analogy of the SRR model, that that would be the equivalent of patient zero infecting 10 other people and that's it. Right, and that's it. The ten infect people then don't infect uh, 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 don't infect anybody else. If that's the case, then there's no pandemic, right? There, there, there's no pandemic. But that, but we know that. Uh, but what is unique about China, what we've seen occurring the last fifteen years, that it doesn't end there, right? It, 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 it doesn't end. These ten people, they go around and then they infect other people. Uh, they in fact, and then these other people they go around and they infect even more people. So the way that, and that's a way to, I mean that that's that's a key mechanism behind the model. The the, the key me, me, uh, mechanism in the model is that once somebody gets in, uh, gets infected or blessed, right? In, in this case, then they are then then they have the they have the power to go out and infect somebody else. Okay. And then the, the next person that's infected, they have the ability to infect. And that is the key thing that's, that makes the system scale. Because if, it, if it's not for this, if it's just limited to the local part, if it's limited to what the local party secretaries do, then the, then the system is going to be limited to, to just a handful of companies. Right, I'll do a handful of companies, and it's not just that. In the previous paper that uh, Michael and uh, and uh, and uh, so uh, so Yen and myself wrote, the way that we described it is that it's not even the local party secretary that's doing this, but it's entire local bureaucracy that is doing this. It's the vice mayors. It's it's that 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 is doing this. So there's a little bit of scale. There's there is a little bit of scaling there because it's not just the top boss that's doing it, but it's it's everybody in the communist party communist party hierarchy is doing this. But what we think is new is is that it's not just that. It's not just that anymore, right? It's 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 it, it's not just that. It's all these powerful private companies. That that have been doing this now. There's a really fascinating question of, of of whether this is going to continue, right? Because the private companies can only do this if, if they have some power, right? If they are infected, to go back to the to the SR. But 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 yeah. So I, I will say that I, I really apologize for the time it took for, that you spent trying to read the, the 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 paper. But the way to think about it is is really like. A, is really like an SIR model. That really is the essence of the model. And we spent a lot of time trying to prove equilibrium and try trying to do those things. So I think that we are guilty of, of what Keynes uh, is accusing future economists of doing. Uh, it's funny it comes from Keynes because he was completely a literary, you know, completely a literary guy. He just wrote in prose. Uh, uh, but anyway, I've spoken a lot. Uh, uh, June, do you want to take some more questions? Yeah. Uh, Michael, you want to go, Michael wanted to say a few words. 
so yeah, put aside, I, you know. May oh, I just ready. jump in and, and defend Keynes? He actually was a mathematician and he wrote books on probability theory before he went into economics. <laughs> put aside, you know, the model issues, uh, uh, let, let's, uh, let me just address, you know, uh, 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 the questions raised by uh, Randy on the uh, facts part. Actually, uh, uh, these are very good questions, and most questions I think we can we can address. And once again, sorry for 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 the bad presentation uh, of those facts in in the, in the in the paper. But you know, one important thing is uh, I think the most important thing is about state control. And you raise a very good question about you know what will happen if we just support everything together in the hands of uh, of the party. And the reason, actually, this is exactly the way we did in our previous version. Uh, let me let me uh, share my screen because uh, this is extremely important. And what we, what we did in the in the old version is that we look at the connected uh, network in which you know the firms are just uh, interconnected uh, through ownership. And then the question is, uh, if you look at uh, you know the large firms controlled directly controlled by the party, say that. Uh, the centrally controlled firms and locally controlled the large firms, and then just uh, apply a very simple cutoff. Say that you know uh, what is the uh, uh, cutoff for, for uh, majority share uh, for the control shareholder, controlling shareholder. Say that uh, you know you can see the threshold that we are assuming here from fifty percent all the way down to five percent. In the sense that if all these major uh, state-owned enterprises uh, assume that uh, add that their uh, shares up. If you know their uh, uh, shares is above uh, five percent, then we identify in the state is the controlling shareholder. And then see uh, what will happen is like you know if you assume uh, the cutoff is fifty percent, then the state share is uh, like twenty-seven percent, and you lower the cutoff all the way to five percent. Then the state share indeed increases, but you know it's a kind of a modest increase. I would say it increases from twenty-seven uh, percent to thirty-six percent. So in that sense, even if you basically add everything up, then the state share is still you know way below fifty uh, percent. So uh, probably we should uh, uh, show uh, this uh, in the paper so that you know it doesn't cause confusion. So that's a that's a I think that's a very good uh, point. Okay, uh, great discussions. Um, our seminar actually ends at 11.10, so we are already... Um, but do we have more questions? Yes, um, yes, I do. Right? I have, I'm sorry for jumping in. Um, so this is not about the talk per se. I was asked by Bernie and all the organizers to make announcement about live streaming starting from September. Uh, I will show you the uh, website. Um, we found um, a experienced, see you, can, you guys can see over here, a uh, lender who is going to help us. Uh, the name is Xue Shu, and they already built a website and they will start to do live streaming starting from September. Um, so, we are still building this and with help from ABFER and the team from Xueshuo, they have done many successful conferences. So more news will be announced in the future. I just wanna make everybody to be aware of this. The purpose, right now, we have more than a hundred participants for every talk and in the future, uh, I mean, this is a very high quality series of talks. We want those, you know, wisdom to be available to more and more people. That's all I have. I don't know whether Bernie, you want to add more, but that's what I have. I um, I just want to thank everyone, as Seoyan just said. I, 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 I'm very excited about this uh, this series. I think Zhigo is also too. Uh, all the committee members, many of us are here. Uh, we thank you all and also the authors and the participants. And because of the success we have, and so uh, we decided to, uh, to accept this possibility to also broadcast to a larger audience. Uh, but I think it would be very useful to let everyone, everyone know in advance because um, 
it's better to be informed when you participate in something that will be broadcasted. And so next time uh, we are going to have, and the next time we are going to have data collateral. Uh, um, you, you want to say something about that paper before we close off? Yeah, I really don't have anything to say. Just, you know, come back. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, it will be another exciting paper. And again, uh, let me thank uh, uh, Pan Jun, uh, Chin Tai, Michael, uh, 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 oh, uh, Xin Wang, and also Chung An has gone. And thank you, uh, Rando and everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for the participation. And we look forward to seeing you again in September. Thank you very much. Thank you.